This is going to be Revelation chapter 5. And the title is going to be called Jesus, my King. Revelation 5, 1 says, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. So God is sitting on the throne. He has a book in his right hand, which could be the King James Bible, but could be a different book, and possibly the same book in Ezekiel chapter 2. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, When I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. It is sealed with seven seals, and some things in the Bible are sealed until God wants them to be revealed. And when that time comes, he will reveal it to his saints. And remember how he said to Daniel in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 9, it says, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. I believe as time goes on, God will continue to reveal things from his word. A saint in the time of Jacob's trouble is going to have a better understanding of the book of Revelation than we do. And when God seals something, then it is definitely sealed. And this book sealed with seven seals is sealed just as good as a born-again Christian who is sealed into the day of redemption. When God seals something, you can't unseal it. Only He can. Revelation 5 and verse 2, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who was worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. No one could open the book, meaning open up to people the understanding. When it's saying no man could open the book, no man could open the book to make people understand what it's saying. Jesus Christ opened the understanding of the disciples to the Old Testament. He said in the book of Luke, it talks about him taking the Old Testament and showing the disciples the prophecies about himself. He had to show it to him because it was hid from him. Luke twenty four forty five. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Without Jesus, they couldn't understand it. And this brings us to our first point. Our king is a worthy king. This strong angel is yelling with a loud voice that no one is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals. And angels are nothing compared to Jesus Christ, not even a strong angel who has been lifting weights and everything else can open the book and loose the seals. And some say this is Michael, but even if it isn't, Michael can't even open the book. Michael and his angels defeat the devil and his angels. Showing that if Michael is strong enough to defeat the devil, then not even the devil could open the book. And we know the devil can't open it. The Pope can't open it. Not even when he is in his special chair can he open it. He can't open it when he is sitting in Satan's seat. Uh, we see he is a more worthy than any of these creatures. More worthy than any of his creation. Revelation 5, three, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look their own. And 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. No man in heaven, no saint of God is worthy. No one on earth, no scientist, professor, Bible corrector, athlete, or any false god is worthy to open the book. And neither under the earth is there anyone worthy to open the book. No man or devil or angel in hell and the bottomless pit is able to open the book and to look their own. If you want to have your eyes open to the Bible, then the only one who can help you is the living word, and that is Jesus Christ himself. A preacher can make known the sense of a verse, but this is done mostly this is done most effectively through giving other verses. And not by a bunch of stories that have absolutely nothing to do with the Bible. This is because when you compare Scripture with Scripture, the interpretation is coming from God. And Revelation 5, 4 says, And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look their own. And when a man realizes he isn't worthy, 
he will weep. And when we realized we weren't worthy, we came to God as a broken sinner. No man was found worthy to open the book except the man, Christ Jesus. And First Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ came down to this earth, and he was fully God and fully man. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. He was worthy to do this because he was the sinless son of God. He is the mediator between God and men, the only person worthy to open the book, the only person worthy to give understanding of the book. Next, we see that he is not only a worthy king, but he is a prevailing king. Revelation 5, 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Prevail means to overcome, to gain the victory or superiority, to gain the advantage. Jesus Christ is a winner. He died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. So he prevailed. He conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. Jesus Christ gave a knockout blow to the spiritual wickedness in high places when he laid down his life on the cross. So he prevailed. He triumphed over them. Colossians two fourteen and 15, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. At the rapture, when we receive our glorified bodies, death is swallowed up in victory, because we have a prevailing king who always comes out victorious. 1 Corinthians 15:57 says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Even in the time of Jacob's trouble, even the saints in the time of Jacob's trouble have to overcome the Antichrist by the blood of the prevailing king. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 15.2 shows us a scene of these saints who got the victory. It says, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. So Jesus Christ, the prevailing king, is our rock. Matthew 16.18 And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus Christ is the rock, and no man's going to prevail against him. Jesus Christ is the prevailing king, so it is only right for him to reign forever and ever. Revelation 11:15 says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. One day Satan's not going to be the God of this world. Jesus Christ is going to come in and take over. He's not coming to take sides. He's coming to take over completely. Satan's going to be chained in the bottomless pit. And Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is going to rule in righteousness. Revelation 5.5, 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. So the worthy and prevailing king opens the book. He is an intimidating king. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Nothing is more intimidating than the roar of a lion. Hebrews 7.14, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Isaiah 42.13, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. Jesus is a lion. The devil is a lion. The devil wants to counterfeit everything. And right now the devil walketh about as a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. He doesn't want to do anything but steal, kill, and destroy. But at the second advent the tables turn, and the Lord Jesus Christ comes out of heaven with a sharp two-edged sword, seeking whom he may destroy, seeking whom he may devour, and he will be coming as a thief in a night to steal back what is his. He's going to kill the God-haters and destroy the enemies of his people.
God showed his everlasting love when he came the first time, and now he is going to show his wrath and vengeance when he comes the second time. He is the root of David. Jesus Christ, as the man in the flesh, came from the lineage of David. Revelation 22:16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Matthew 1.1 1, 1, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Jesus Christ, as the man in the flesh, came from the lineage of David. And Revelation 5.6 And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And now it talks about Jesus Christ as the Lamb, a Lamb as it had been slain. He will still have the marks in His hands and His feet when we see Him. And many times in the Bible, a Lamb will typify Jesus Christ like the Passover Lamb in Exodus 12. But the four beasts weren't worthy to open the book. The elders weren't worthy to open the book. But the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, which is Jesus Christ, is worthy to open the book. Acts 2.23 said he was slain by wicked hands. The wicked hands of man aren't worthy to open the book. And the seven spirits of God mentioned here, as close, to, I can, as, close as I can see, they are written in Isaiah 11.2. You can find the seven spirits of God there. And we talked about that in Revelation chapter 4. So Jesus Christ is in the midst of the throne. And most likely God the Father and the Son share a throne. Jesus Christ being the body, God the Father being the soul, and the Holy Ghost being the spirit. We also have a body, soul, and spirit ourselves as humans, but God can manifest himself in more than one place, unlike us. He is omnipresent, and so he is everywhere at once. Uh, Revelation 5, 7, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. The Church of Christ, the denomination, the cult, must be more holy than these saints in heaven because they say they can't have instruments in their services. In the worship services in heaven they have harps. So they must be in sin according to the church of Christ. But the prevailing king is also our mediator. There is one mediator between God and men, this man, Christ Jesus. So these prayers of the saints are put in front of Jesus Christ as vials full of odors. Our prayers are sweet savors to God and they are stored in bottles. God likes the smell of our prayers. Psalms 141.2 says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Next we see this prevailing king is also a sacrificial king. Revelation 5.9 says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Isaiah 42 and verse 10 says, Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth, ye that go down to the sea, and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Of course the song is about the blood. Hebrews 9.12 Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us and in revelation 5 9 and they sung a new song and this song it's about the blood of jesus christ first peter 1 18 for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot Jesus Christ laid down his life so that we could be redeemed by his blood. He shed his blood for the sins of the whole world. He died for sins past, present, and future. He died for people of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And next we see he isn't just a worthy king or just a prevailing king or just a sacrificial king or intimidating king. He also is an unselfish king. 
Revelation 5.10, And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. We are priests, and 1 Peter 2.5 says we offer up spiritual sacrifices. Jesus Christ is worthy to have the reign all by himself, and we aren't worthy to reign with him over anybody. But he is going to be unselfish and share some of that reign with us. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ, then we would have never been made kings and priests. We wouldn't have ever even had the middle wall of partition broken down. We wouldn't have had the enmity between us and God done away with. We wouldn't have ever been reconciled. And notice it says kings, priests. Kings and priests, but it excludes prophets because there is no prophesying in the millennium. Hebrews 8, 11 says, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. And then in Zechariah thirteen three, it says, And it shall come to pass that when they shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that beget him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord, and his father and his mother that beget him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. So there's no prophesying in the millennium. Everybody's going to see Jesus Christ on the throne. And without the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, we would never have the opportunity to reign with him. Second Timothy 2.12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And lastly, we see that he is a worship-worthy king. Revelation 5.11 says, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. Okay, so the verse mentions beasts, elders, and angels. And this shows the beasts are different than the angels. So seraphim aren't angels, and cherubim wouldn't be angels either. This is different classes of beings. Many times people make the cherubim angels and they make the seraphim angels. But if you read the Bible, you'll see that angels are look so much like men that you can't tell them apart from a regular man. That's why in Hebrews it says, talks about entertaining angels unaware. And these seraphim and cherubim, the seraphim have six wings, the cherubim have four wings, and they're strange looking creatures or at least would be strange looking to us they don't look like angels and god is surrounded by millions and millions of these beings who will worship him for eternity daniel seven ten says a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him thousand thousands ministered unto him and ten thousand times ten thousands stood before him the judgment was set and the books were opened there's going to be thousands of people that will stand before God and worship him there's going to be thousands of thousands of thousands that will be judged by him every creature and per person ever made at one point is going to stand before God at his throne and every person is going to get down and kiss Jesus feet and tell him that he's Lord angels who are much greater in power and might than we are fall down and worship the king Hebrews 1, six and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. The angels worship him. Psalm 66.4, all the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. Psalms 95.6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Psalms 99.9, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill for the Lord our God is holy during the millennial reign of jesus christ any people who don't come down to bow down before his feet will be without rain zechariah fourteen seventeen says and it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto jerusalem to worship the king the lord of hosts even upon them shall be no rain so they're not going to have any rain if they don't come to worship him Revelation 5.12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power 
and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And notice that there are seven things here for Jesus Christ. Seven is the perfection number because Jesus Christ is perfect. Worthy is the Lamb to receive power because He's all-powerful. Riches, He gives out the riches of His grace. Wisdom, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Strength, because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Honor and glory. 1 Timothy 1.17 Knowing to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen and blessing. Let's look at the blessing. Psalms 103.1 Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. And back to Revelation 5 and verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And such as are in the sea. And all that are in them. Heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power. Be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. Every creature in heaven, earth, and the sea will praise God. That means God will put words in the mouth of animals like he did Balaam's ass. Animals will probably talk in the millennial kingdom. And that's why every kid's movie has talking animals. That is why you have movies like Zootopia. They, they want that world where animals are friendly and they want to get that without going through God first. So they make movies about it. But Jesus Christ is going to get the worship that is due to him. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. That the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In our Revelation five fourteen, And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Notice that phrase, that liveth forever and ever. God's not dead. I have the same proof in front of my face that God is alive as an atheist has. I have the Bible and I have the invisible things of him from the creation of the world that are clearly seen, being understood to the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. I am without excuse. The atheist is without excuse. I've got the same advantages he has. I've got a Bible. I've got the world around me to see that God's real. The only difference is I'm going to place my faith in Jesus Christ and they're going to be foolish and reject Jesus Christ because they want to be their own final authority in their life. We both had the same proof, but they reject the proof because they want to be their own final authority. They want to party. They want to do whatever they want to do and they don't want to have to answer to a holy God when they do so. Revelation 118, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore. Amen and have the keys of hell and of death. And that's Jesus speaking. He tells you himself, I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore. Jesus Christ died for us. He died on the cross for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And if you want to be saved, you have to believe that gospel. The gospel is that Jesus Christ died. He died for you. He died for your sins. He was buried, and he rose again the third day. He died for you because you're a sinner. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned and none of us can make it to heaven on our good works. So if you want to be saved and go to heaven, quit relying on your own self-righteous deeds to save you and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one that was righteous. And he died for you. And if you'll believe on him, then he'll give you his righteousness. Colossians 4 and 14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So if you believe on him, you'll get his blood, his righteous blood applied to your soul. It'll wash your sins away. Acts 16, 31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I hope you'll get saved today before it's too late.